Thomas said, we're going to have three, three different points of view. So uh, I'll start off uh, with an introduction, and then uh, Christian and Anna will give their thoughts. <coughs> so uh, if you just uh, skip to uh, where we are in the world, uh, there was a new road construction called the uh, Riksvei 325. We excavated 75 uh, sites from uh, 500 BC and up until uh, 1300 AD. Uh, we are in uh, Löten and uh, Elbrun, uh, up in the inland Norway, as you can see on the map to the left. Uh, on the left map we also see uh, uh, all the sites there, and the uh, archaeology sites, and then we see the, the new road here. The contractor is uh, Staten Zweibe in Wesen, uh, organizing the, or paying the building. Uh, so, we're going to focus on this site called uh, Anasa. And uh, this was a site with uh, iron extraction. We excavated uh, 29 furnaces uh, from the period 600 to 800 AD. That's uh, the Merovingian age in uh, in Norwegian terms. So this is... Uh, move over here. Uh, <laughs> um, new road is coming uh, here. So uh, there were registered uh, five sites, sites on this side of the road, two sites up here. And uh, the sites uh, we're gonna dig more thoroughly were this one and that one in addition to those two, which were single furnaces. Uh, you can see uh, a furnace from uh, both sides here, uh, quite uh, bad preservation uh, uh, on the right side. Uh, here, only like 10, 20 centimeters left of the structures. Uh, a little better preservative uh, conditions on, uh, on the left side of this road. Uh, or you can see if, uh, the, this is uh, something like 40 or 50 centimeters, uh, the bottom of the furnace uh, in situ, uh, top of course being plowed uh, away from uh, agricultural use of the site in recent years. We also had uh, slags all over the place, you can see a piece of slag here, and uh, uh, as we'll come into this disturbed uh, situation a bit for us when we're excavating. Uh, had Mike Fylkeskommune had surveyed the area, the uh, trenches going uh, in this direction, uh, 40, tri 40 uh, trenches in total. Uh, in total, they had found seven furnaces, two iron working areas, and a slag heap. Uh, the uh, county archaeologist conducted five C14 datings, all in the time frame within 600 to 900 AD, uh, with uh, only one being from the late part of the period. So we're, uh, we're probably early in the Merovingian age. Um, yeah. A little bit background uh, iron extraction. Uh, in the period uh, 600 to 800 is uh, quite uh, little known, as we can see here. These are uh, an example of Norwegian furnaces from the uh, from the period. Uh, let's see, can't read. Uh, we're in the Roman age here, uh, about uh, the birth of Christ, and up until 600. Uh, it's this. Uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, shaft furnaces with slag pits. And then the technology changes uh, in the Viking Age and up until the medieval times, where we have the, uh, the side tapping, <coughs> where the slide, the slide comes out uh, in a bit on the side. And we don't really know what happens technology wise in the period in between. So uh, uh, this was uh, one of the main things to find out in the project. You can see the same thing here in uh, about Danish uh, furniture. For instance, we have the slag pits and then the, a period where we know nothing uh, until we come back to the site tapping. Uh, I also 
uh, including the rise of the orchid complex, uh, because this is uh, the area where we exploit uh, is very close to uh, the site of Orkir, a very uh, famous uh, site in Norway uh, from the Merovingian time. Uh, it's, uh, as you can see, a very nice collection of finds uh, in close proximity to the site we, uh, site we excavated. Uh, you can see, uh, see uh, all of this in our ex exhibition at the museum. Uh, this is associated with both the aristocracy, as you can see, uh, Scandinavian and continental leadership from the time. Uh, with the closest parallels in Mendel's Valsialida, as you probably know, and also Sutton who in Suffolk. Uh, uh, the Orchid Farm is, uh, is uh, situated uh, at Orchid a very central position and at the junction uh, from, for travel on Mjösa, uh, the King's Road from Oslo to Gudbrandsalen and the road to Österdalen. So, uh, a meeting point, so to say, and uh, when we started, we, we thought maybe uh, the iron extraction can relate to the expansion of orchid. Did farmers deliver iron uh, at orchid where it was shipped away for further trade on an international to a uh, more international audience? And uh, we also know that the iron trade became an industry in the late, late Viking Age, uh, so did. Early Iron Age production formed the basis of the wealth at Orkir. That was one of the questions we asked before we started. Um, iron extraction in the project plan, I'm just going to say uh, a few words. Uh, little is known about uh, the extraction in the period 600 to 800. The furnaces at Omsta are considered highly relevant to explain the change in technology. Uh, there is also a little bit about the location. It's on the border between the cultivated uh, land at uh, Hedmark uh, and uh, the taiga, the woodland of inner Norway. And uh, we also have a possible closeness to the farm as opposed to uh, medieval uh, iron extraction, which is uh, mainly away from the farm. So there is really no com comparative uh, material from beforehand, so both the technology of the period and civil sites and structures are not well known in Norway. And on this background, uh, we made an introductory mapping uh, of topsoil magnetic uh, susceptibility and radiometer. And on destructive uh, method to quickly map and delineate the sites, the uh, method was also used uh, with success at uh, Jofer, quite uh, close by to the northeast, and, uh, <coughs> and we have many examples uh, uh, from arable land and also famous sites like the Snorup site in Denmark. Uh, the idea behind using geophysics was to further map furnaces that were not found when the uh, Fylkes uh, uh, were digging trenches. In addition, we aim to find other elements of production that were not picked up when surveying uh, with normal trenching, like iron ore, charcoal layers, roasting places, slag heaps, iron working areas, uh, in addition to traces of settlement. So this was what we hoped for, and uh, now the others are going to tell you what we got. Alright, uh, so uh, I did geophysics and uh, basically we did topsoil uh, magnetic susceptibility uh, in the hope that we can be able to try to delineate the activity areas and maybe also trace rosing sites. Uh, the areas that they were explaining was this one and that one, and the topsoil might just kind of pick up something along the road. We also pick up probably some pollution from the road itself, as you see, and it goes along there. But also, <coughs> that area here with, the, with quite high readings, and I think the average was about six or seven meters between each region. And uh, we also have some other areas kind of This turns out to be kind of a refuse pit and some farmer go down a, I don't know, a tractor or something, so that can happen. Uh, and this wasn't excavated, it wasn't test trench, but it also gives quite a high reading and there's some, some uh, magnetic elements in the area of the data as well. Uh, and we considered uh, topsoil analysis work 
very well on, on our field sites in the forest where it hasn't been part of. Uh, and also we kind of got an indication of the delineation of the activity sites. Right. So these, uh, I think it was like seven hectares or something of top soil limits, and then we did about five of phosphate grading of the data. Uh, yeah, I'll just move on to this for the two sites. So I, I based on yeah, it was all in the test we were we were there. So we based on a comparison of where we knew they found firms so we can at least have some form of target that we can use to to you know, to better interpret the data. So I use that and and categorize them as uh, archaeology, potential archaeology and some other categories that I described in the report, such as trends and, and linear features. Uh, so this is the year that was uh, delineated based on the test structures as you see on there. In there, there's quite a few quite pronounced anomalies, and so several of them was interpreted as, as furnaces. This is a particular example. In each of these you know, lines are about two nanometer lines. I think that furnace was at least over 100 nanometer in strength, uh, and it also is characterized by its size, by, by the, the visual appearance. School properties uh, and <coughs> so on. I'll come back to that later. Another thing I did was to, uh, based on the background variation of and the statistical variation of the whole data set, I, I defined a threshold and uh, I uh, extracted every anomaly over a certain size and over a certain threshold. And then I did a kernel density mapping of all the anomalies over a certain size and strength. So you can get <coughs> Although maybe not all of these anomalies might be uh, archaeologically relevant, then, but maybe the distribution of them could tell you something. And as you can see, you got a kind of a highlight in the area where they were about to excavate. Also, this fits your road. You also have some other areas. There is a road going that way, and there has been a road going over that way as well. So, so it creates some problems. I think it's over to Kirsten to tell us a little bit about the excavation results, and then I'll move back to the analysis afterwards. Uh, I just want to start with uh, what, uh, telling you how the sites and the furnaces look like. This is on the east side, and you can see this is what the furnaces that the company found. And they were very thin, they were far away. So this is the deepest one that we had at this site. So, but most of them were like this. And the top supply was between 10 and 30 centimeters. So we got all of this data from Anna, and uh, I was sat there like, wow, this is a lot. Uh, what am I supposed to do? Uh, so this is the area that the county uh, sent us the localities that where we're supposed to date. So we use only the interpreted data. This is the interpretation that Art made. So you can see, like the yellow one is the trend. So and all the furnaces and all the archaeological. So what we did, we started the excavation by opening up this area as a normal excavation, and found the furnaces that we were supposed to find and find more. And then we realized, oh, there is a road here and some bits, and they're not in the data set that we got from Anna. Because these uh, furnaces are the furnaces down here, and the road are not there. And then we said, OK, let's find the furnaces that's outside our excavations area. Because this, we were supposed to excavate here and here. Then we started, uh, we put all of the furnaces and possible furnaces and some possible archaeology in that 20 years and we went out with the excavator. And then we got all, all of these test trenches. So these were possible furnaces. And what we found was, it was four stones, three stones on this side, nothing in this, and uh, clay here. So it was a bit of a disappointment for us on this side. And also, the small the one there that's interpreted as furnace in the data set, but it's a stone. So on the west side of the road, the situation is a bit different. The furnace looks like this, 
in plan, quite hard to see, and they're all leaning towards one side. So these are one of the smallest ones, and these are one of the biggest ones. So this is the top, and then it's been leaning all the way from the bottom here. <coughs> and the, the underground is completely different as well. I mean, the top side is uh, much thicker. So this was the area that the county registered with the we <coughs> got from uh, Hana. And then you can see some fur possible furnaces lying outside here that we wanted to uh, see if there were furnaces. So we started up doing the test just before we uh, opened up the area. And we dug four test pits and none of them were furnaces. There were two stones and nothing in the rest of them. And this big thing is a stone fence. And in the interpreted data that we got from Anna, uh, the stone fence weren't in the data. So we were quite surprised when we opened up the, the big side here and we saw all of these stones. Here you can see it. It's this stone fence. So for us, the why isn't this in the data that we got from Anna, where we're finding all of these stones that were supposed to be furnaces, but he hasn't found this one. And that could be something to do with how we see the data that we got from Anna. He'll come back to it later on now. <laughs> okay. um, well, um, I have a different point of view on this. <laughs> when you look at the uh, true positives of uh, features that I thought could be archaeology or numerous archaeology, actually, I think the percentage is quite good. So it's 63% that was actually more or less correctly interpreted. And 20 of the features that you excavated uh, as archaeology didn't show. So there's a false negative. So I consider that quite good. So, so obviously, it's, it's something on how you perceive and look at the data and, and, and the knowledge that, uh, the background knowledge I have in looking at the data uh, while we're, and, and maybe the lack of, of, of familiarity with using data as part of an excavation project and how to plan it. So, so basically, I consider it quite well. You've got very nice uh, furnaces there, and then in, in, in all the high the magnetic response, there was actually quite a few furnaces when it around. Uh, but when you look at the geology, it turns out that the average response in the large rocks was more or less in the same range as the furnaces, if you look at just the furnace line in, as it, in, in, in itself. Uh, but the max marines are 100 meters across in around 76 and same here. And also, you can see like this is a furnace and that's a, um, a down rock. Yeah. You know, visually and, and the geophysical response is quite similar. So can we now, after looking at it and actually having some form of, of, of uh, uh, the proper data that we can prepare, get any further close to that. So this is the maximum strength of the uh, of the furnaces and of the rocks. And you can see they're both in more or less the same range, the average is there, the cellular deviation is roughly the same. But when you look at the size of them, you can see that the furnaces, and the largest one that turned out to be a furnace is working around three meters. But then we look at the geophysical, that's the geophysical response on it. And if you look at the, the size of the them that turned out to be rocks, they're actually usually larger than three meters across. So if I knew that in before I can use that and filter out maybe all the anomalies larger than a certain size, and maybe then the the you wouldn't have to go out and open up clearances to big rocks because that's not that fine. Also, if you use the raster data set, you'll actually see that the, the physical response is there for the wall fence with a negative with a, a small positive within it. But I, in, in, as part of my data interpretation, I focus very much on the, on the positive anomalies and didn't look as much uh, on the negative response. So it is in there. It's just that uh, it wasn't in the interpretation I gave you. Is that a hint? Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. And also these ones, we haven't really figured out why we get a geophysical response and you didn't find any. It could be that it's either something in the top soil that got removed or it's something 
where you can be basically cumulative that you could be response and try and, and calculate that uh, based on the response so maybe that can explain it. Um, so we're going to just wrap it up. Uh, so I, we have each we have a few slides now with my, my um, experience on it all and, and the site director and the project manager's experience of, of working with this data. I consider this results actually quite good. And also in the eastern part of the wall, uh, I found eight out of the nine furnace. Uh, top soil MS response pretty well delineated the activity areas. Uh, but we got some problems with false positives. In terms of the furnace it turned out by the early on the rock so with that single domain. So. Christian's point is a bit different. Yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah. Um, we had to open the area, the main experience areas, regardless of the geophysics anyway, because it was that's why we're there, we were supposed to excavate the area. So whatever furnaces he found um, inside the main excavation area, we would have found anyway, because we were supposed to be there. So to us, the data set seemed inconsistent. So the so the signatures that were supposed to be our geology new stones, but we that like these stone fence were the data set that we used, and like he said, if we used the raster data set, then we might have seen it. But that comes back to us that we have really too little knowledge about the geophysics on site and do our own interpretations into the raster data sets. And to, for me, it was just white and black dots. I don't know what, is it archaeology, is it still no, it's just white and black, do I say that is it? And for us it didn't yield any more additional information about the site that we wouldn't have found out if we just did a normal excavation without the geophysics. So, it's a, well, we have a different point of view on, the, <laughs> on that. We're still friends. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll try to sum up very quickly. Uh, in my point of view, uh, it's based on the, the museum's job as excavating authority. Uh, and that is to ensure that as much data as possible is saved before destruction of, the, of a site. And uh, <clears throat> above us uh, in the hierarchy is the Directorate of uh, Cultural Her Heritage that's responsible for all sites in Norway. And uh, as they approve our budgets, we need to have really good arguments to be able to include expensive metal metal methodology uh, into the excavation uh, strategies. And uh, before this project started, we were uh, our budget was uh, cut by one third. So I consider us uh, quite lucky to be able to even include the uh, geophys uh, at this site. Uh, in the particular case, uh, ge geophysics didn't yield much more in addition to the surveying uh, of the county archaeologists, and uh, as the geophysics didn't pick up any additional features that we uh, that <laughs> that we had uh, planned for, or or at least hoped for in the project plan, that's that's like uh, roasting places and uh, <coughs> work areas and things like that. Uh, that might uh, have to uh, have to do about. Uh, <clears throat> the site being so plowed over, of course, but uh, in retrospect, I don't know. Uh, then there is the economic aspect. It's quite expensive. Uh, the geophys equals the sum spent on pollen coring and analysis, and this pollen analysis is of great help when al analyzing all sites in the project and also for future research. And uh, well, uh, I think that uh, in the future, uh, geophysics will have to be something that's uh, done in research project uh, and at the county archaeologist level. Uh, I don't think we're going to be able to include it uh, into our pro uh, projects. Uh, the job is, of course, made difficult by slags being plowed out in the topsoil, disturbing signals from deeper down and so, so on. Uh, difficult subsoil as well. Uh, but. Uh, in conclusion, I think more methodological work is needed before geophysics is applicable uh, in rescue archaeology of similar sites. Thank you. Thank you.